I managed to actually lose my Laplander saw uh, recently, so my wife got me a new one for Christmas. Um, why is everyone so mad on Laplander saws? The only disadvantage I can see with a Laplander saw is they're green, so they're made of invisible. So if you drop them, you ain't going to find them again. Um, so I generally try and switch this leather loop out for something like a high vis paracord, um, something you're going to see if you do drop it. You know, it looks all nice, but realistically, leaving tools in the woods is really, really bad move because kids could pick it up or obviously there's the cost of it as well. So why are Laplanders so good? Well, first of all, they don't fold up on you. A lot of them you get a button on top here. Um, you hit the button and it can fold up and then do that and then trap your fingers. Whereas this, it clicks and you can't fold it up again until you press the button. Um, I've not seen a saw similar to that. Now everyone goes mad for silky saws and yes I've used silky saws, I think they're amazing. Um, but there is a tendency to snap a silky saw. So I now need a new sheath for my Laplander. Usually a sheath would be a sheet of leather, you fold it in half, like that, and then you go, let's have a Laplander sheath, so something like that, and then you would stitch all around here, and then fold your saw in. It's been done. Uh, then the other one is, you get two bits of leather, which is, this is what I had before. You put your Laplander on there. And then you wet form a piece of leather over it so it takes on the contours of your saw and then locks it into place so it looks really, really cool. So what I'm thinking is if I am cut a piece of leather that looks like that, then... I can have that coming back on itself as your belt buckle bit. And then these sides, these that have holes all down. So we go and then we sew this up. So we end up with a tube and then we sew the bottom up here like that. Then we wet it and we force the lap lamp down into it and hopefully it will take on the shape without just snapping all the stitching up. And then it will look different because I've not seen it done so we're going to give that a go. Instead of having that bit on there I'm going to stitch the strap on differently so once I've got me my leather there, I'm going to sew on the loop like that on the back. Six inches by nine inches. We'll just check if it's square because I like to keep everything as square as possible. No, it's not. So that's our square edge. trim off of there and we want to come in I do like a steel rule but they do tend to get damaged the cheap ones right so we want six inches from the edge to there and then we want eight inches no it's right nine to the top and then we want six from the side. Six from the side like that. And then you join those two up. Right. And then we go nine inches from that line. I made a line there where I squared it off, yeah? So we don't go to the edge, so everything should stay square. So I want to keep this as square as possible, because obviously we come around and meeting itself. We want to buffer these edges at the moment 
we've got a square edge, so that makes it harder to buffer. So if we go around with an edging tool, and there we do that. Yeah, so that's taking that little coil off. So when it comes to edging it, it'll be a bit easier. One of these is longer than the other. So it is perfect for measuring your distance. That's what we've got there. Five mil. And then we can round like that. About five mil from the edge. And we come along like that. Okay, so then we've got a line all around the edge and that will show us where we can put our pricking irons. So you can get these ones that are a lot more delicate and they do tend to snap off, which is a few have snapped off there, where they've been put into, bang through into a piece of wood. So these ones, further apart and they're stronger, so they're gonna last. Now, if you're going around a corner, you can't use, um, how many is on that? Six. You can't use a six fork. So we've got four forks and a two forks and I've got a one fork somewhere. But ten is a uh, two is generally okay for getting around most corners when you're doing edging. There you go. Right, so, so the idea is to bring that together like that, squish it out, and then hopefully when it's wet we can force that into there and it will take the shape then we can put it in the oven or something and dry it out and it should maintain the shape <laughs> this is um leather conditioner that i've made up now got tissue in there uh so this is a mixture of coconut oil um Castor oil, almond oil, uh, and beeswax. Um, so the beeswax um, doesn't rot. The castor oil is your base. The almond oil gives you your shine. Um, and coconut oil is one of the best oils for not rotting. Um, so when you bring them all together, it kind of works. Coconut oil is amazing stuff for not going rancid. It's one of the lowest um, values for the amount of stuff that rots. Um, rather than cover it in all in horrible chemicals. Um, which, to be honest, things like tongue oil aren't as good as coconut oil um, for rotting, but it will give it a better shine. And I don't care about shine, I just don't want it to rot because I'm taking it outdoors. So we give this a good dip in here because we're going to lubricate the forks on this. Now, if I just bang this in dry, don't want to go in dry, lads. Yeah, if I just bang this in dry, it's going to get caught and it gets really hard to pull back out, and then you'll end up breaking the forks. Right, so we've got six there, and then we come over, and then we've got another six there. So we go up in increments of four. And they're all starting from the same place, so these ones should line up with these ones because this is square, etc. Right, so when we come to knocking them in, I've got a big wooden mallet. Make sure you go all the way through, and then that should come out a little bit easier. Now, the, the other advantage to put in the um, conditioner on this, this actually puts the oil inside the holes whereas you can treat and you can polish if your piece of leather gets wet in the future it's not going to have any protection inside the holes so if you go through with an awl afterwards and open out the hole once, once you put your thread in there then the leather will naturally come back and grab onto the thread um, and then it will be a lot tighter um, once it ages and starts moving and it'll, it just 
takes the friction as well off of the thread when the thing's moving around and being forced. Um, but yeah, just, just better all round. Okay, so just to make sure, they're all gone through and I counted all the holes and there's 37 holes. That is going to come round and those two are going to be stitched together like a little barrel. And then this end is going to be pancaked down and that is also going to be stitched. Um, so this leather conditioner, because there's all gummy fingerprints on there, it doesn't matter, it's not going to affect your end product of the leather. Um, a lot of people, they'll, they'll smear something like Yehoba oil over your piece of leather first, and then when you put your coloured oil on the top, um, it stops using as much oil. It just kind of thins it down, stops the leather absorbing as much, so it's going to use less oil, so it works out cheaper. Um, on a little project like this, I don't think, don't really see the problem. So we're going to want a loop on the back here, like that yes so like a like a question mark that sort of thing so to start with we want to go around and do the edging on this so we'll take that off a belt is generally about 40 mil wide so we won't want that longer than about 150 Very gently give us a light mark so we know roughly where we're going. So that lines up quite nicely there. Okay. Three inches, that's the centre. Uh, if we come down, I don't know, what, two, one and a half. one and off okay then we'll just go through Can we mark those holes on there go through with a brick and iron Right, so then we get that stitched on there, and then we can bring that over and we can do the stitching on there. So, and I like using nice big sized needles. So, something nice and big like that because the more delicate your needles, the harder they are to see. So, we've got some nice brown here. So, I only want a little bit. This is quite rigid this uh, and it's waxed which is good so this thread is good but when you're doing a very long stitch what tends to happen is this thread the wax wears off and it goes a bit fluffy um, so it's nice for little jobs but if you've got to make a handbag or something I wouldn't bother using it pull the needle so it's longer than the needle itself a little bit further and then I poke the needle through like that now when I pull that I slide that down and pull that and slide that down and pull that and slide that down now that's not going to pull out of there right so gone all round so we're going to come back in there <laughs> out 
the side. Put nice and tight. And then where we started. Three inches is the centre. What was we? 32 mil, 16 mil, 32 mil, bit and a bit. So as long as it sits in the middle there, it's going to be square. Okay, so that's that bit done. Um, and now it's coming to stitch this bit up. So I'm going to stitch this tube first, and then <coughs> afterwards I'm going to clamp that down, and then do the bottom last. Um, I think that's just going to make it easier for me to get both sides. But this ain't going to be pretty. Pretty. So I'm stopping this here and then the other stitch will come across there so I can just tie these two together. Ow! That's right, it's not the first time I've had a prick in my hand. I'm just going to go and soak this in some water for well, just till it stops bubbling, so literally like a minute. It don't take long at all. Okay, so that's now wet. Now what I want to do is flatten it. So what I'm going to do is get a bit of wood. A bit of MDF. Okay, so that's flattened it down so just to give these better corners, so that's squished it. <laughs> 